with that, I'll hand it across to the great Mr. Peter Kennedy. Voting this time for the first time. Well, yeah. All right. Thanks very much. <coughs> okay. So, uh, so senators, it's, uh, there's a, a fair bit, uh, fair number of votes out there to be won this afternoon. <laughs> so, uh, the ball is in your court. So, without further ado, uh, the uh, election, of course, uh, coming up very, very quickly on September the seventh. What? Just uh, eleven days or so, ten or eleven days away. So, uh, here's their chance to uh, influence you in your vote on, uh, on that day. The first question. I don't understand why both major parties have agreed to cut university funding when they both advertise that innovation and development is the way of the future. University is the place where this happens. Why has federal politics given up on students? Sue Lawrence, would you like to kick off? Yes, thanks Peter. And firstly I acknowledge that we meet on the traditional lands of the Noongar people and I pay my respects to Elders past and present. So um, Labor certainly hasn't given up on students and in fact Labor has increased the amount of funding available to universities and while some funding has been diverted to the Better Schools program, universities are still better off than they were under certainly the coalition governments of the past. And I think it's also very important for universities to look at how they're spending their money, how they're attracting investment. And when you've got most of the uh, vice chancellors in this country sitting on salaries of a million dollars, I think it's a good question to ask about how universities are spending the funding that they get. Your, your vice chancellor here sits just under a million dollars. And to give you a comparison, the prime minister's on about 500, so half a million. So uh, Labor hasn't reduced funding overall, universities are still better off, they have to be smart about their funds and if we've got strong student guilds that hold universities accountable to how money's spent then I think uh, we'll all have a good future. But the government has taken uh, a couple of billion dollars out of the university's budget over the, over the next few years and that's rather unprecedented. Yes it is and if we look at our education system, if we don't improve Australia's primary and secondary schools then we'll have empty universities. We're starting to slip in the OECD, which was why we looked at Gonski, and Gonski is a program which is about funding schools according to need. It's a very expensive funding. It's, it's good policy to say that it's not about your postcode, it's about what need the school has. And in order to fund that, funds had to be diverted from a whole range of areas. And whilst some funding has been diverted, overall, universities have still been better off under this Labor government. Well, uh, Dean Smith, the, uh, the Liberals have more or less gone along with the Gonski formula, haven't they, after some initial humming and harring? Uh, so say that, that that money would be deprived of the universities as well? Uh, well, there was lots of humming and harring in regards to our position in Gon on Gonski. Just on the eve of the election, we decided to uh, support the Gonski reforms. But on the specific issue of higher education funding, I think we can look at what the Howard government did as an indication of where we might see Tony Abbott's priorities. So what we know under the Howard government is that university funding was increased by 13% at a time when enrolments grew by 58%. Uh, when we think about higher education funding, I prefer to think about what we do to relieve day-to-day -day pressures on students. And of course the Liberals abolished the compulsory student fee uh, and have done a variety of other things. So I think when we think about student issues in the context of this election, Higher education is an important element, but it's not the higher education funding is an important <coughs> element. You must also look at those broader issues of economic development and growth and what that means for employment prospects. You must look at what it means for returning the budget to surplus and what that means for the education investment fund, which we're committed to restoring. Uh, so issues of student issues at this election extend beyond the issue of higher education funding. Scott Butler, where do the Greens stand on this? Well, we think it's a bad idea to cut funding from education in order to provide funding for education. That's really our bottom line. A $2.3 billion hit, not just on the universities, but on students as well. It's going to mean larger class sizes, equipment doesn't get upgraded and installed, and it means every one of you will walk out of here with a higher level of debt than you would have otherwise. There's the reason why the NTEU, the tertiary education unions, called these dumb cuts. They're dumb. They're not what we should be doing. 
Um, we also support the Gonski reforms. I think they're not necessarily being in the applied in the same way as David Gonski proposed, but nonetheless it's an improvement. But what we need to be doing, to be very clear about this, is take on those industries in this country that can afford to pay a bit more from the gargantuan profits that they're making so that we don't have to cut important areas like universities, tertiary education, TAFEs, uh, and so that there is a, a properly funded tertiary education sector. One of the reasons the Liberals attacked compulsory student unionism and had a go at the guilds was deliberately, and I was there for the debates, to try and depoliticise students and remove that voice of solidarity that students had been campaigning for exactly moments like this, when you're at risk and when the universities are under attack. In 2008, the Bradley Review said increase tertiary education funding base level by 10%. So the Greens, to this election, have brought a policy that says we will oppose these cuts. They're unnecessary, and we support that Bradley recommendation of increasing base funding by 10%. Yes, yeah, see nice. I just wanted to uh, make a comment on something that Dean said. Uh, under the Howard government, what, uh, what Howard did was force universities to agree to that funding by opening up their uh, union agreements and forcing uh, every single agreement that existed at a university to include the option of forcing people onto individual contracts to, to reduce their wages. So Dean likes to gloss over that, but that was the first time in our history that a federal government, indeed a prime minister, had interfered into the operations of universities through saying your collective agreements you will only get access to this funding if you open up your collective agreements to be able to force people on individual contracts. Yeah, do you, do you, go, do you go on with that? I think it's a bit rich on one level to start your remarks by talking about the salaries that chancellors and vice chancellors might get and then in the next breath oppose the idea that other university employees shouldn't be in more competitive uh, bargaining situations. So there's a fundamental inconsistency <laughs> there. I think, um, I think we hear a lot about the Greens, uh, but really if you sort of look more closely we hear about slogans. And you must always, I think, <coughs> dig deeper behind what Green candidates say. The suggestion that university students are at one is ridiculous. I'm that. sure I solidarity, I think, was the word you used, Scott. So I'm sure in this room there are students that come from different religious backgrounds, different political affiliations, different ideas about how the world should be governed. So the idea that university students are at one voice on every issue is just ridiculous. All right. It's, uh, oh, it's, yes, I just uh, think it's really on. funny that the Liberal candidate just accused the Greens of using slogans. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, very funny. Fair point, fair point. Alright, <laughs> <laughs> we might come back to sloganeering, but uh, no, there's not. many going on during the election campaign. Let's go on to uh, the issue of uh, employment. And I uh, uh, read the newspaper stories and the media this morning, generally speaking. Generally. Unemployment is a huge issue for the majority of students throughout Australia. What measures could the federal government take to encourage employment for students? And then uh, the reports this morning you might have seen uh, that uh, Tony Abbott and the Liberals were uh, going to provide uh, something like six and a half thousand dollars to encourage unemployed young people to uh, take work, and of course quite a uh, quite a comment on the uh, morning radio programs. But uh, Dean Smith, what what's, what is it, and what's behind this? Well, if you look at the detail of the announcement, what uh, Tony Abbott and the Coalition are talking about is providing uh, incentives to help long-term unemployed people get back to work. And I think many of us in this room would think that that's a, that's a noble and important gesture. It's a good uh, idea, but do you have to bribe people to do it? Well, uh, I would use the word incentivise. I wouldn't use the word. <laughs> I wouldn't use the word bribe. And I think, uh, and, and no one is suggesting that long-term unemployed people should be bribed back to work. But the conditions that long-term unemployed people find themselves in are different from many in this room. Um, certainly, from my own position when I left uh, university. I think when we think of, un of unemployment more generally, though, we do need to keep it in perspective. Uh, when I left university, when I left UWA many, many years ago in the early 1990s, the youth unemployment rate was at 12%. 12%. So think about that for a moment. 
Uh, in the current environment, you're looking at between 5 and 6%. So to be concerned about job opportunities is legitimate. Uh, to be concerned about unemployment when you're a university student, particularly an institution like this, I don't think uh, is warranted. But why should taxpayers' money be used to sort of uh, draw people into the workforce when, when, when most people in the, in the household, uh, when you finish school or whatever, dad gives you a boot in the, in the backside to go out and get a job? Well, I think, you know, when we look at the costs of long-term unemployed, it's not just about paying someone an unemployment benefit. Uh, there are lots of social costs that accompany long-term <coughs> unemployment. Uh, there are social costs, there are difficult, uh, difficulties in regards to uh, accommodation and housing. Uh, you know, the issue of long-term unemployment is not just about not having a skill. There are many other issues that might uh, be inflicting that particular person who is you know, has not had a job for a long period of time. So my strong sense is that the upfront payment to incentivise people back to work has some long-term savings, not just for the economy, but I think many of us would agree that having a job uh, gives us a stable and constructive way to sort of engage uh, in our relationships and gives us a certain sense of our personal meaning. Yeah, Scott, I'm, uh, that's a good idea. Are they following the march on you? I think it's really nice that Tony Abbott announced a policy that's excellent. Um, I think that was a slogan. That, that, no, it was a, it was a, it was a bit of a joke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I actually didn't see the detail announcement, um, so I'm not going to give you a hardline Greens position on it, but it doesn't sound like a terrible idea to me. Um, I agree with most of what you just said then. If you are in the long term unemployed, it's entirely likely that your parents are or were as well. So I'd want to see exactly what kind of detail got announced there. but. Giving people who are at the margins and, and are the least advantaged in our society a bit of a helping hand using sometimes the carrot, not just the stick, as we so often see, doesn't sound like a terrible idea. The other thing, of course, which is where we, where we were before, is make sure that the education is there. You know, make sure that TAFE is strong, make sure that university is strong, so that we're not spilling people into the workforce who are unqualified. So if you actually want to get out and try and get a job, we need to make sure those opportunities exist. Sue so Lyons, a good idea? The Liberals come up with a good idea? I'd like to ask the question for the audience. Who works uh, on the weekends or evenings and currently gets the penalty rate at the moment? If you could just put your hand up. Yeah. So the problem with Tony Abbott's uh, solution to unemployment <coughs> is that he thinks any job's OK. And certainly he has given no commitment at all that he won't get rid of penalty rates. So that 50% you get working for a Saturday or the 15% or 20% you get for working an evening. Uh, Tony Abbott's got no commitment to that. And what we see, if we look back at the Howard years, uh, which Dean referred us to before, is that uh, any job was okay. So what we saw under uh, Liberal governments previously is they're quite prepared to slash penalty rates, with, they're quite prepared to slash uh, base rates. So that was the whole work choices thing. We don't have any commitment now. And in fact, Tony Abbott's on the record as saying, look, any job is better than none. Picking up rubbish is better than nothing. And he said that in relation to Aboriginal employment. I don't think that's good enough. There are far too many Australians currently who are underemployed, who struggle on 18, 19, $20 an hour, who need uh, more hours per week. So any job, or cutting penalty rates, or cutting base rates, is not a good idea, and I haven't heard anything from Abbott about that. And certainly, Labor has the runs on the board when it comes to looking at employment. We were the party that introduced the 1.5% levy on big businesses in this country to provide training to staff. Howard got in and, and, and slashed that. We've opened up trade training centres across uh, this country, and I was at Pinjarra High School last week and opened one. Fantastic opportunities for young people who don't choose university. You can get a certificate two and potentially a certificate three while studying at university to make them more ready for employment. So Labor has the runs on the board when it comes to comes to employment and protecting people's working conditions. Uh, the Liberals have just got slash, slash, slash. They have the history of work choices. Abbott thinks any job better than none. Uh, none of that cuts the mustard for me. Uh, it's not slash, 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 there was cut, cut, cut. I know. <laughs> but look, uh, just, uh, just on this course, you might have seen this um, story in the newspaper yesterday in the Australian, uh, and uh, it's particularly pertinent, uh, pertinent to, uh, to this group, and it says, uh, young voters may decide result. And uh, in the one paragraph said, the analysis shows the under 35s, under 35 right there, are driven by values rather than party loyalty, are more likely to vote for Labor and the Greens, 
especially young women, and are the most electorally influential demographic group, despite their low level of enrolment. So, uh, so Dean Smith, if, uh, if young people are more likely to vote for Labor and the Greens, uh, is this a cause for concern for, uh, for the Liberals? And is this part, perhaps uh, why this policy on uh, unemployment was announced? Well, I, I do agree with the comment that young people are probably looking towards values rather than policies not just at this election, but if I think of my own um, experience as a young person interested in current affairs and signing up to a political party, and then what influenced me, it was absolutely about a set of values. Um, I don't think anyone will be surprised about newspaper articles that suggest, rightly or wrongly, that young people might be more inclined to vote for Labor and the Greens. Whether or not they stay voting for Labor and the Greens over their voting history is another question, and I think you'll find that many people don't actually continue to follow that. Many people do. But I think what's fundamental, and I think that there is a shift in our community on this particular point, the idea that you can look at an elector, whether he be a young person or she be a young person or an older person, and put upon them a whole set of ideas and to stereotype them, um, I think, is fast losing favour. I think political parties, if they're to be successful in the future, they do need to understand that people are much fluid in their ideas, uh, their sorts of interests do change as they have different sorts of uh, circumstances, whether they have young families or entering the workforce. So the idea that someone is a Green voter or a Liberal, I think that that's somewhat um, unfair on the elector and I think we should need to sort of pay much more attention to um, how individuals or smaller groups of people are ex exercising their political judgment. Sue Lyons. Just a very quick comment. Uh, interestingly that Dean says you can't make that judgment. In this morning's West Australian, Don Randall, the Liberal member for Swan, said you can sum a person up in seven seconds. Canning. Canning, sorry, the member for Canning. When he door knocks, he says within seven seconds I know if they're a Liberal or not. Quote. I'm just going to intercept the mic for a second. Well, what's the green view on this? <laughs> Pretty good. Um, not hey, put your hand up if you were born on or after 1992. Nearly all of the room. So here's the thing, and this is why I think accounts for some of that statistic. 1992, nearly all of the world's governments signed the Framework Convention on Climate Change. So for your entire life, you've lived on a planet where a, a global agreement unified the entire planet's economy, apart from places like North Korea and wherever, agreed we were going to have to make that dramatic shift away from fossil fuels. So you are actually the climate change generation. Now, I suspect it doesn't explain all of it, and Dean, you were right to pull me up before on that, the, you know, the kind of solidarity or thinking alike it wasn't what I meant, but it was worth pulling me up on it. But I think there's a very strong will to look beyond the next three years because you are the crew who are going to be living with the consequences of decisions like these, I think that's partly what accounts for that generational shift. Because that same poll that you were holding up before, Peter, shows 65 and overs, that's your cohort, that's your worry. You know, those are the folk who are mostly voting for Libs and the Nats, and they're, you know, getting on a bit. <laughs> uh, if I might just say, I don't hold Sue accountable for Craig Thompson's actions. I don't think it's fair to hold me as, uh, accountable for Don Randall's. Might I just say, though? Might I just say? Might I just say that I think that Scott no. is quite right. Really? No, I do. No, 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 I, I do. And, and, and I'll, I'll, no, 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 sorry. What's going on? So, so I was, I was, and I was reflecting on this this morning, just uh, about today. I do think that young people have a slight. Uh, are thinking more long term. I do think that that is that is what I sense when I listen to young people, when I look at what they might write or what they might say. So, so I think on that particular point, uh, I think Scott's right. Okay, could you right. possibly right. have a quick chat to your boss about the whole climate change? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I, no, not necessarily long term on climate change, but Bugger. long term. <laughs> Long, long, long term view on a variety of issues. All right, we thought we had a breakthrough there. Let's, uh, let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. The change, slight change of pace. I am concerned about the rising cost of the compulsory student union fee. As a student, I struggle with money. Senators are love them. How do you justify students paying a compulsory SSAF fee, a compulsory student fee? 
it's not really a compulsory student union fee. In 2005, um, the coalition, they couldn't get Barnaby Joyce's vote to his credit, they got Stephen Fielding's. They knocked student guilds over in the same week that work choices, welfare to work, radioactive waste dump, laws of terror, all passed in a parliament where the Senate didn't have any agency because John Howard had control of both houses. The last thing they did on the last afternoon of that horrible fortnight was smashed up the student guilds. So there is no compulsory student unionism fee anymore. The unis control where that fee, what is it here? Is it like 250 bucks or something? Is it of that sort of order? 220? 260. All right, you can tell how long since I've been a student. Um, so that fee doesn't go to the student unions. It goes to the universities who can spend on whatever they like. Guilds don't necessarily have a lot of agency over where that money actually goes. And to be honest, if you'll bear with me, I kind of wish they did. I still think we need strong guilds on university and that means they need to be strongly resourced. To be frank, I'm more worried about the $30,000 debt some of your crew are going to be carrying when you leave this place than about the 200, whatever it is, $260 to at least provide some marginal services to students. I actually reckon that was a pretty poor idea to knock them over in the first place. Okay, uh, two lines, you got a thought on that? Well, I absolutely agree with Scott. I, I do believe in strong student guilds. Uh, when you're at university, you need to have an independent voice, a voice that speaks for you in the same way that you're, when you're in a workplace, you need a strong independent trade union to, uh, to represent you in your interests uh, with employers. So yes, there should be strong independent uh, student guilds. I agree with Scott, the way, the way guilds have, uh, currently get the money by begging universities is not appropriate. I also think we should look at innovative ways to pay. Um, I understand it has to be paid up front. And it could be put on a direct debit where you pay once a fortnight to spread the cost because when you're earning uh, 17 or 18 dollars an hour plus your penalty rates, which John Howard wants to take away on the weekend, uh, finding that money up front John is, is no, yeah, I don't know what's wrong with that. Tony Abbott, same, same, same. All right, John Howard, we blame for yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My apologies, Rich John Howard. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, you should be able to direct debit them, um, but strong student guilds are critical to strong uh, buzzing universities. So I support them, but let's look at better ways to uh, for you to pay, and let's get the money uh, off the university and into the student guilds. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, can, can we just sort of project ahead to say 2023 now? Because this question uh, might relate to 2023 and just where you might be in 10 years' time. And the question is uh, along these lines. Oh, Peter, if I may. Uh, yeah, yes. Are we still talking about student fees? Uh, no, I was going to move on. Well, I, no, I'd like uh, to actually. Yeah, if I may. I'd like to. Because when I came to UWA, being the eldest child, no one in my family, no one in my extended family had ever been to university before. So I trot down to UWA to enrol. How horrified was I to find that I had to pay four or five hundred dollars to a guild I didn't even know about, to a guild that didn't even represent my point of view. There's nothing more objectionable in this country, in this day and age, that people should be forced to do things against their will. Yeah, yeah. And, I would, and I would have thought the most powerful way for the guild to be strong, the guild to be representative, would be to take people's money voluntarily. To take people's money voluntarily. So the abolition of compulsory student union fees is a good thing, and I've got every confidence that Tony Abbott and others will uphold that if he's elected to government. Peter, can we, do a, on can we do a I quick... I might just add, I might just... Sorry. Can we do a quick straw poll? Sorry, Dean, you finish and then Scott, um, you No, I'm, I'm keen to actually take a quick... Uh, so, so, so I think I'm very, very clear. I completely disagree yeah. with Sue and Scott on this point. Can we get a quick straw poll? Because it sounded like there was pretty strong views both ways. Is that allowed? Oh, you'd like... You'd like a little I don't know what the room reckons. Clear their hand. You're the students. We're, we're just sitting All up right, here as old. Those in favour of, uh, what, compulsory student unions? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Thank you. Those against? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Well, can I just, Dean talked about a little bit of history. Can I talk about a little bit of history? When I enrolled as a student in 19... When I enrolled as a student in 1961, UWA had just stopped being a free university. Had just started charging fees. It was the only free university in the country. Had just started charging fees and uh, included my guild fee was a levy for the uh, construction of Hacker Hall, for an extension to Hacker Hall at the uh, front of the university and the, the, during 1961 
the extension was open, half of it was funded by the Guild, half, I believe, funded by the Commonwealth Government, and it was opened by um, Robert Menzies back in 1961. So in those days, students were kicking in for the buildings. So uh, just, just, you think you're getting it tough. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think too many people complain about that. But anyway, that's what happened. The, um, so the question is this, casting your mind ahead to 2023. The baby boomers were able to buy houses relatively cheaply, they're probably your parents, relatively cheaply and with ease, according to the question. Whereas our generation can expect to spend most of our working lives attempting to pay back a mortgage. Now, if we ever envisage owning our own home, has our generation been ripped off? And what can be done to even things out? Sue Lyons, would you like to start there? Yes, certainly uh, Western Australia in particular has a housing affordability issue and certainly the Federal Government has got the NRAS scheme in place which has just funded uh, new student dwellings across the road there, 523 new student dwellings, that's uh, courtesy of the Federal Labor Government for any of you who currently live in those studio and one bedroom apartments, uh, you can thank the Labor Government for that. And certainly there's a housing affordability scheme, but it's not enough. We've got a lot of blockages in the system, whether you're, whether you're homeless and in crisis accommodation, it's very hard to move out of that into transitional uh, accommodation because we don't have enough. What about in 10 years' time, and everyone's a graduate, and according to uh, the story, you're earning a bit above the, uh, or perhaps considerably more, above average uh, income. So how are they going to fare? Well, people on higher incomes are not the group who are out of the housing market. It's people on 55,000 and below. So it's cleaners and childcare workers, uh, education assistants, people in the service sector generally, whether they're on single or double incomes, are the group that are priced out of the, the housing market. And of course, the mining boom is adding to that too, where we have young people particularly with debts of a million dollars by the time they buy a four by two or a six by three and an and a SUV and then suddenly lose their job, they've got a million dollars worth of debt. So what's, an S what's an SUV? <laughs> you've been, you've been uh, away too long. No, no, I just, I, well, I don't know what it is. It's a souped up four wheel drive. You know, okay. yeah. I'm in on it. You see them everywhere. In the so, city, yeah. so yes, we ha do have a, a, a crisis in housing affordability. Labor's done a lot in that area. It needs to do more, uh, and we need to ease that crisis in Western Australia. We need property developers on board so that we build uh, better housing, that we do more infill, that we do more density and so on. There's a lot that can be done, uh, and we've just got to get everyone lined up. Uh, Amazingly, in the affordable housing space, most of most people agree there's, there are a common set of outcomes that, that uh, everyone wants to pursue. So I think it's solvable, but it's getting uh, governments, both federal and state and local government, to, to move on, on uh, opening land up, on easing uh, building restrictions and so on. Scott Ludlam of the Greens got a plan. Yeah, we, we do, and we're actually the only ones who put it on the table. I'm going to be fairly blunt here, you have been ripped off. Um, there's an entire generation that's been priced out of home ownership, and you can still see that pitched as really great news in the real estate pages of the paper, that property prices went up again by 15% this year, open up the champagne. That's fantastic if you're already an investor, if you're already in the market, if you've got three properties, then good for you. Uh, but there is a whole generation of people who will never be able to buy their own home, and you're going to be renting for your whole life. And we have a really insecure and volatile rental market that you will find yourself, and this has happened to me a couple of times, flipped out of a tenancy for no other reason than the owners wanted to sell it or their circumstances changed. We have no security of tenure and very few rights as renters in Australia. Housing affordability wasn't mentioned in the Prime Minister's election announcement speech, wasn't mentioned by Tony Abbott. The Greens are actually the only ones in the field this time around, I'm not completely sure why, talking directly about housing affordability from the homeless end of the spectrum where there are 103,000 homeless people in the richest country in the world through to the fact that you can spend more than a decade on the waiting list for social housing because we run public housing stock into the ground. We're working with this young woman in WA who had to flee a violent relationship in February of this year. She's got two kids. She's sleeping on a mattress on the floor. She got told, yes, you will go onto the emergency list. You might be there for three years. 
you know, and the NRAS scheme, which the government tried to kill during the Queensland flood levy, and we were fortunate that we were able to persuade them not to, is important. It's a really good piece of the puzzle, but the rest of the puzzle is missing. Okay. Uh, we need a big investment in housing. Okay, Scott, uh, is it as dismal as that, or is there some, uh, is there some sort of light at the end of the tunnel? Very good point. I don't do the oh, woe me. And if we go back to the original, if we go back to, if we go back to the, uh, if we go back to the original question, 2023. If you think you are going, to, if you're a university student at UWA and you think you are going to get no something for nothing, then you're very, very naive. Uh, getting a mortgage is actually a fact of life. So I've got every confidence that many of you will actually find employment, will actually find your own homes. I think what's actually changed, I think what's changed in our country is expectations. I think expectations have changed. And when we think about home ownership, how many of us think about going and buying a house in the outer metropolitan areas of Perth? Or how many think, oh, I want that fantastic little house in Mount Lawley, or I want that fantastic little house in Netherlands? I think our expectations have changed. And if we keep those in check, if we keep those in check, uh, we'll have a very, very bright future for each of you. Well, right, thank well, you very much. Well. On a similar thought, but on a, on a bigger level, uh, this, this is the, the issue of, and both sides of politics have been accused of it. Both it's, sides? It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that means you haven't, Scott. <laughs> well, that's true. Maybe I have. <laughs> we'll come to you. <laughs> but the question is this. Should my generation have to pay for the mistakes and waste of the current government? And it's, 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 it's linked with the issue, I think, of rising debt. But uh, Sue Light first, uh, is that a fair comment? I uh, know I don't think it's a fair comment. I, uh, you know, I don't understand why we are so driven by this notion of uh, a balanced budget and surplus when we have homeless people on the street, when we have a lot of need in our community. We need to. A budget is about providing good community. It's not about. Uh, it doesn't stand alone, and it doesn't simply mean that we've got to balance the budget at all costs. I mean, we do need to provide communities that are safe, where people can live, where they can have a reasonable expectation uh, of a good life, and that to me is what good government's about. I don't agree that Labor has uh, squandered anything. We've had good policies in place. We took this country through the global financial crash. We're a lot better off than countries uh, in Europe where the debt's high, uh, where unemployment is skyrocketing. Australia's done very well, and that's because it's had good economic ma management set up initially through the court, the Hawke-Keating era, and continued on uh, through Rudd and Gillard. So, uh, yes, I think more needs to be done. Uh, I don't agree with this notion of uh, surplus. And Tony Abbott's, trust me, we'll get the numbers to you at some time in the future, or just trust me, when he is madly spending money and saying there's going to be a surplus, just does not add up. So thanks very much, uh, Sue. Uh, 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 now, the economic students here, you, you'd be thinking, well, you know, what about balancing budgets? What about living within your means? Uh, and uh, then, because uh, rising debt means you have to service the debt, and that's a lot of money you can't spend on other things. So, Dean Smith, is it a question of overspending, or is it a question of better targeting of spending? Well, the first thing I'd say is it's your money. It's your money. It's taxpayers' money. So the first thing is I like the idea of surpluses uh, with the expectation of that taxpayer surplus will actually be returned back to taxpayers over time. I think it's highly irresponsible to be talking about budgets and not being, and not being required to get them into surplus. Uh, surplus is a wise way to operate. You won't be surprised to hear that from a Liberal with sort of classical Liberal values like myself. I don't think you're being ripped off but I do think you've absolutely been let down uh, by this Labor government over the last six years. You probably may not understand the full ramifications of that until sometime into the future, but remember that Labor and the Greens have been hand in glove, have been hand in glove over the last six years. So I do think people have been let down, and I do think the responsibility lies with Labor and the Australian Greens. So does that support for surplus budgets also apply to State level, dare I say? No, very good point. Very good point. I'm, I'm, I, I am a Liberal parliamentarian and I go to, to Parliament to represent my Liberal values. And sometimes I have different views from other Liberals, indeed, different views from my leader on occasion. 
Uh, so I think surplus budgets are a good way to proceed and those surpluses should be returned to taxpayers. Scott Butler, is this a, is this a theoretical view or is it going to be realistic? No, it's very, it's very important. At the top of a commodity cycle, if you're not running budget surpluses, there's a serious problem. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, quite seriously, the question is, where has the money gone? So the global financial crisis absolutely is very important, and I think the government, with the support of the Greens, responded appropriately, with a surge of spending to basically lift us out of a recession. So we dodged that bullet. But the question is, where's the money actually gone? You know, so we're now running the country at a loss at the top of a commodities price cycle. Where's the public transport? Where's the renewable energy investment? Where's the universities investment? Where's the investment in the industries to come when the iron ore price crashes or the Chinese Communist Party falls apart? We are at risk of presiding over a hole in the ground surrounded by expensive real estate. And that is where I think you've got to look a little bit beyond the surplus question, you shouldn't be running the country at a loss at a time of unprecedented prosperity. You run deficits because you are investing in the years to come. So I think what we've actually done and what happened during the Howard years was huge wastage of strong budget surpluses over a period of years that were channeled into middle class welfare, tax cuts for wealthy people, and we haven't invested in the infrastructure that we're going to need in decades to come. Okay, thank you very much for that. Now, we're coming towards the end of our time. That's cool. uh, but, uh, it's, uh, I don't know where all the time has gone. But can I just put uh, this question to uh, all our, uh, to our three guests? The Senate was initially a state's house. So what is your role do you, when you're in the Senate? Is it to represent Western Australia or to support the party room decision regardless of whether it is in WA's best interests or not? Thanks, Ben. Hmm. Thanks very much. Uh, well, those um, of you in the room that know me uh, will know that I've been in the Senate for 14 months. Um, I came in on a casual vacancy and I describe myself as a very strong, strong Federalist. Um, in that 14 months, um, I did challenge my party leader and my party's position on weak de deregulation because I thought our position was the wrong one. Um, and I threatened to cross the floor, didn't have to cross the floor because it wasn't put to a vote in the end. Because we won. Um, because we won. The Greens were supporting um, deregulation of the Australian export wheat market. Well, we were so, supporting wheat growers. Yep. Uh, WA wheat growers. Uh, secondly, uh, and this happened in the, just in the last few months, uh, I was the first coalition senator to write to uh, Tony Abbott to say that I would not support local government recognition in the Australian Constitution uh, and I voted against it in the Senate um, and we can have a debate about that another time if you invite me back. Uh, I'm glad that it hasn't proceeded. So uh, I represent Western Australia in the Senate. I do so through the prism of my Liberal Party values. Uh, that does mean sometimes I find myself at odds with uh, my party or my leadership uh, but uh, life's tough. It is indeed. Scott Butler. I, I suspect you'll find we've all got similar experiences. It hasn't worked, the Senate hasn't worked in the way the framers of the Constitution intended because political party discipline across the different parties is very strong, even stronger than the United States Congress, for example. Um, but what does happen, and Dean's given you some examples, I've got a few of my own, is that the party rooms of the various parties are proportionally uh, topped up with people from the smaller states, which means the, the fights and the debates tend to happen a little bit more behind the scenes and you get a more balanced outcome when things finally come to the floor. All right, thank you very much, Scott. And uh, Sue Lines, uh, where do you stand on that quick state house? Well, I hope to be able to represent Western Australia and uh, represent Labor values. Certainly as a West Australian Senator, I'm going to be focused on affordable housing and homelessness and justice reinvestment. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to be very vocal about that and to try and uh, get better programs and better outcomes uh, than we currently have, particularly in justice reinvestment, but also homelessness and housing affordability. I do believe in the power of the collective. For those that know a little bit about me, I come out of a trade union, so I have seen and I've participated and I know from first-hand experience that being part of a collective is really what wins the day. Yes, I have strong views. I sit on the left of the party. I have very strong views. I will voice those uh, loudly. Uh, as I have done in the past within the forums of the party. But I don't see much a benefit in uh, crossing the floor unless it's on a conscience vote on same-sex marriage. But uh, for the rest of the issues, uh, I will be a collective voice in the Labor Party, but I can assure you that I will be very loud at 
party forums uh, at national conference at the ALP state conference. And in Western Australia, I am absolutely uh, committed to homelessness and housing affordability and justice reinvestment. Thank you very much for that, Sue. Can I just say, can I just say uh, of our three guests today, which ones are looking the uh, more or most relaxed? Because, uh, perhaps I should have pointed this out at the start, uh, only one of our guests is up for re-election on Saturday week. Really? <laughs> which, which one is it? <laughs> it's not Senator Smith. Uh, it's not Senator Lyons. It's Senator Ludlow in the middle. He's the man in the hot seat. So uh, he's the one. He's the one who's got to Thanks, say. Peter. <laughs> the other thing, Peter, I'd say is I've also stolen Dean's title. I am now Australia's newest senator. Mm. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, that's. Uh, we I'm not relaxed on the inside. <laughs> it's been terrific, been a terrific lunch I don't know where the time has gone, but it has just raced away. You've been a terrific audience, so thanks for those questions that you uh, handed in. So we're going to